Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion, and uh, these are all your questions coming in. Uh, you can do that in Makana, of course. You can ask questions. You can vote on them. If you're not in Makana, you can um, go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. You can throw your questions in there, um, and we will bring them in either today or tomorrow. But go ahead and throw those in. You can do that 24-7. So even if you see this show later, uh, askofficehours.global will get you there. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York, and he says, Morning, everyone. As a business in 2024's economic climate, would the panel recommend focusing more of your attention on paid marketing, such as ads and sponsorships, or organic marketing, social media content, events, and so forth, to move your business forward? Good guy. Yeah, it depends on what you're selling. Um, there's a couple terms you might want to become familiar with, a uh, customer acquisition cost or your CAC. LTV, um, the lifetime value of a customer. Uh, I recommend thinking about those and uh, taking care of your your existing clients. Uh, the cheapest uh, road to, to business uh, recurring is take care, good care of your customers and have them come back, and more than that, tell their friends. So you're only as good as your last your last gig if you're selling a, a service. Um, you know, just do high quality work, and that work will keep coming, and you won't have to go advertise. So it, it is a blend. If you are going to go out there, I wish Liberty was on the panel today because she's been doing a lot of social media, and I see her active on LinkedIn. And so sometimes it's it's keeping mindful. You don't have to go whole hog on any of these, but uh, pay attention to who's being successful in these are arenas and do a little they're doing because you can blow through a lot of money on Google ads. Uh, believe me, I've spent, uh, I wasted a lot of money not knowing what I was doing and just let it run. And I woke up one morning trying to compete with some big uh, box houses and uh, blew through thousands of dollars inadvertently just by not putting in the right keywords. So it, you gotta, it, it's, it's truly a blend, but yeah, word of mouth marketing is probably your cheapest bet, but Definitely look at uh, churn, uh, monthly recurring revenue. There, there's certain terms that any savvy business owner or CEO uh, will know these terms and, and really start to research and dig in and, and get a coach. Uh, and then it's the culture of the company as well. Like treat your employees well because they're the ones that are getting in front of those customers and making them want to come back. And they're the ones pushing the buttons or uh, making sure that quality is there. So take care of your people. Yeah, to, to, get, to really underline all the great stuff that Guy just said. You know, the, the first step is that you get, you know, I know you can get the job, but can you do the job? Doing the job is a really important piece of it. So the execution of whether it's a sales or services or whatever, that execution become, that should always be number one, that you can actually get done what you said you were going to get done or, or what you're bidding on. Uh, number two is, is, of course, exactly what Guy said. Hold on to those customers. It's the cheapest way to do that is to, is to make sure that they're taken care of, that they, you know, a lot of times we were, I was talking to someone about this over the weekend is that I really look at places where it doesn't cost me. Some people will go into, oh, there's places I could charge the client for something that doesn't cost me very much. I look at how I throw those in. <laughs> so I try to figure out if there's something that doesn't cost me very much or, or anything, I'm going to try to throw it in. A lot of times I used to bring extra cameras. I used to bring extra because it didn't cost me anything. They were sitting in the warehouse. And I would, and I would just add a little bit of value. So anywhere I could find a way to add value that wasn't expensive to me, I would charge them for what needed to be charged for. And then I try to add value to, and it was little things. It was from extra cameras and extra switchers to, to, um, you know, making sure that they had their iPhone chargers and making sure that we had a place for them to sit and making sure that everything was like, and not like a place to sit, but like a place where all the power cables were the same color as their branding. <laughs> you know, like, so all of those things, you know, you create this environment for them to do that so that it, and what they'll, what'll happen is they go somewhere else and they feel the drop off and that's what you want them to, you know, always want to be adding that to it. The other thing that, as far as marketing goes, what I've done for the most part um, has been do things that serve, the, serve your audience, serve the people that, you're, that potentially would hire you, and then promote those. So you, do, you promote the, the free services, the content marketing, you promote those things, and that creates a funnel so that people know who you are and what you do. But you're not promoting your exact service. You're promoting the thing that you're doing. That is, so that, that way, when people see it, you're telling them about something, and they go, oh. Oh, the, you know, like I, I actually want to go see that. It's not whether I, I'm not making a decision about your service. They're making a decision about the content you're delivering to them. And in that you're building a very slow relationship with them over time um, to where they go, oh, maybe I should call that person you know, and, and have that there. But service to the industry, service to your industry, whatever that industry is, and then promoting that service, I think it works, works fairly effectively. And then, you know, sometimes doing things that are 
a little outlandish. Um, if you look at uh, whether it's Virgin or Red Bull, what they're really good at is doing something that inspires people. And they've taken brands that otherwise are commoditized and make them. I mean, Red Bull is a horrible tasting drink that is not, pro you know, that comes in a small can that costs more than a Coke. And, they, and they've done crazy things to tell, to, to tell you that that's worth it. Um, one person that I, that I follow a lot, I, I, that I watch a lot of clips on is Rory Sutherland. Um, just, just look up Rory Sutherland. Yeah, I just, he is for me, the, the gold standard of, he, he, he he's a, I think he's a VP at Ogilvy and he just talks about the most crazy things about marketing that if you do this, it, you don't think it'll work, but it will. And this is the, these are things that work and he's so good at it. So, um, that's, that's who I watch, uh, at least once a day somewhere. <laughs> so, um, next question. Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. FFmpeg 7.0 was released a few days ago. What does that mean for us as users? Good running. Just be aware, if you have this in the, in the current uh, workflow, you should be very, very aware of the fact that it's uh, not uh, backwards compatible. Um, a few other things is that uh, they, they made the CLA uh, multi-threaded, which make it runs a lot faster. Um, and they also um, put a new uh, audio engine kind of thing in, which also make it possible to to do um, ambisonic in a better way. And there's a lot of other uh, small features, but beware if you have it in a, a already a workflow, uh, I would test it thoroughly before implementing the, the version seven. And another thing, the, the most difficult thing about this uh, release is probably the, the new name they put into this, uh, which is Dijkstra. So any I can pronounce that better. Uh, I would like to hear it. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes from Jesse Kester in Glendale. OC sent us their new SDI Stream Deck for review. We'll be spending the next two weeks torture testing the device. What would you like to know? We're excited to crack into the device and we'll focus our review if you have questions. Good, Courtney. Well, one question, where is it going to stand price-wise? Because this is kind of competitor for the, uh, the Mini, ATEM Mini. Uh, it does a lot of the things the ATEM Mini does, and it'll be it'll it's now competing with uh, yeah Jesse's just holding it up there the uh, ATEM Mini SDI. Uh, I'd love to see a comparison uh, uh, feature for feature with the ATEM Mini and what price wise. I thought it was going to be more expensive than two ninety five, which I think is the current price of the HDMI model. But I'd like to see what the pricing is and uh, if there are any features how it compares with the with the new one, how the new one compares with the STI version. Any good running, and it has a T bar. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, I would like you to test uh, a few things. First and foremost, I would like you to test the remote control uh, systems. How, how is it possible to remote control it? I've grown used to just use uh, Stream Dex or or uh, or uh, BitFocus Companion for controlling every. Uh, almost every uh, aspect of the ATEM series from Blackmagic. Um, the other thing I would like you to test and compare uh, kind of wave to wave is the audio uh, processing. If that is a lot better, uh, that would mean uh, that we have to think uh, thoroughly on using this uh, on the smaller productions that we have. And and the third one is the encoder quality. How, how does it encode and, and how is it um handling the image quality compared to the black magic which we know has a little beautifier on the black uh, crushed uh, thing um at least uh, coming out of the encoders so so test the encoders and uh, of course the bandwidth and stability of course and maybe even heat could be a, a thing to test and the the one thing i would say is that the non-technical way to kind of measure encoding quality rather than just looking at it and saying it looks better or worse is put some time code or just a, or a counter on your on a video to so take a video and what we prefer to use and jesse if you reach out to me i'll send you what we call a widow maker so this is a we i shoot um waves you know like i when I, anytime you see me at the ocean you'll see me shooting uh these these lock offs of waves and and i these are me grabbing what what we call widow makers and these are very hard to encode because so many pixels are moving and there's reflections on top of those mix on, on those things and nothing is going regularly and as a result, you can really test a, an encoder. It'll never, not, nothing will encode it well. It's just how bad will it be? You know, it's kind of like the uh, Kobayashi Maru, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so the, um, so what you do is, is uh, you take your video, you put a time, you put a, uh, a counter on it or a time code, use burn-in time code. 
and then you encode it through that through both of those mixers uh, switchers. Then you download that file. Preferably, you're lo you're going to send it to something that can uh, either they record or send send it to something that you can record directly. So if you send it to YouTube, you're actually going through two different encodes. But you could if you just if you do them both the same way, they're they're both on the same playing field, so you can just see what happened. But that's the problem with it. But you get those files down. Take that one, take the file, the new encoded files and set them over top of, go into your, you know, Final Cut or Resolve or whatever, set them up and line up those counters. And then, um, and you got, and the counters are important because it tells you that you're getting every frame or not getting every frame, you know, and, and because if you don't get every frame, this won't work at all. And you find a section where you are getting every frame because you will lose frames here and there occasionally. Um, and you set the top one as difference, you know, and so what it'll show you is the difference between your encode and the original file. And if you do, and you, and I apologize ahead of time, Jesse, this will, if you haven't done this before, this will ruin your experience of TV. Like it is, this is a red pill conversation, which is that when you do this, you're going to not be able to see anything again, the same, because what it does, is it shows you all the macro block. So you'll see everything that it's doing. And, and so you'll get to see what that original plate looked like. Um, you'll get to see what the, uh, the breakup is between the two. And then it's really easy to compare quality. I mean, it's, it's super easy. And, you can even mathematically compare it by measuring the overall gray values um, of the of the image um, and polling that, and you can get um, a, a number that will tell you what the difference is. But visually, you can see it. it. What's nice about it is visually, you can just look at it and go, "Oh, there you go." As far as for, for me, that T bar is really interesting. But um, look at the resolution of the T bar. Move it very, very little, very small amounts, and see what it does. Does it pop, 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 or does it go up? It just depends on the resolution of, of what the encoder is. Also, when you go down, how clear is it that it's down? Because the, the problem with T-bars, and the reason I, don't, I almost never use a T-bar, is because at fully down or fully up, it can be easy um, to not get it all the way down or all the way up, and you end up with this little bit of uh, ghosting from the other image that's super subtle, um, and it can be missed, but is real pro really problematic. So, so those are the things that I would, that I would look at there. Obviously, fe looking at what feature to feature it is. Does it have external software? Does it have... Um, you know, uh, does it have the DVE? Does it have green screen keying? Does it, you know, those are some pretty op obvious ones that we'd like to know as well. Go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> we can. And the actual computer when you go into something like Zoom or both. Yeah, it's both because uh, on the ATEM, the encoder is actually the same. So it's only the HDMI coming out of the ATEM that is different from the from the encoded signal. So fr from the ATEM's perspective, the, the signal going out to the stream or via the uh, RJ45 network adapter and uh, going into UVC uh, via USB is the same picture as I've understood. So just test all those aspects if there are differences in the different output uh, types uh, coming out of the box. Good guy. Yeah, and jumping over to their Facebook page, it looks like they'll be at NAB and they have another switcher that does SDI, NDI, UVC, and HDMI. So I'm kind of excited to see if we can scoot over there to their booth or invite them over since it's such a small device. Maybe they can just come over to our booth and hold it up and show us uh, what the features are in comparison. But I do have the SDI uh, A10 Mini and my curious question would be just how does it handle Zoom 1080p flick overs where um, sometimes there's this uh, interrupt that occurs and can cause that black screen. Um, so I, I'd be interested just to see how smooth the UVC transition is from a 360p meeting when it, somebody spotlights somebody and grabs that signal to see if it's uh, more stable. I don't know if you have the ability to test that. I have a 1080p account if you want to reach out to me on Discord and uh, we can start a meeting and play with it. Next question. Francis Frey in Cambridge, Massachusetts. How to get audio out of a Rodecaster Pro 2 and into a Blackmagic Video Assist 12G7? That's our first QR code question this morning. Good, Carl. So on the back of the Rodecaster, you'll find a quarter inch monitor outs. So these are TRS, there's two of them, one for left, one for right. So you can take those out and you'll go into, there's mini XLRs on the side of the um, Video Assist. Now, these mini XLRs, you will need to find a cable that will go between the two. Um, it's pretty easy to find um, one eighth inch, so 3.5 to mini, X, to mini XLR. Um, and then you just put a, a quarter inch to one eighth inch adapter on there. 
um, make sure in your video assist settings, you change it from mic to line level. So it will be line level out of the, out of the, uh, out of the uh, road. Welcome back, Carl. It's good to see you. Uh, it's good to Thanks have so you back much. here. Thanks. Um, next question. Next question comes to us from Darren Cirillo in Dallas, Texas for casual video record, excuse me, for casual video recording on the iPhone 14 Pro Max family, stuff like that. Should I be shooting in 4K 30 frames per second raw or 4K 60 frames per second? Good, Carl. For stuff that you just want to get, you don't want to miss, so for like family stuff, um, I'd use personally, I'd use the built-in camera app, set it to 4K 60 in video. You can choose to have HDR on or off. So that's got to be HLG Dolby Vision. The reason why is because you just get it straight away. You don't have to, you don't have to mess about with um, the Blackmagic camera app. Um, if you're comfortable and you have presets set in the Blackmagic camera app and you're quite used to it, you can use that and you can shoot like a, a um, ProRes or RAW. Um, that's not a problem. But I personally, for family stuff, really quick stuff, I personally use a built-in camera app. And if I'm setting up, if I've got like two to five minutes, I will get out the Blackmagic camera app. Uh, that's personally your choice, but if you've got like a couple of minutes, maybe black magic, but built-in camera is probably the best for those kind of things. Go, Jesse. I don't know the shape of your family, but if you have kids, I would definitely go with the slow, the 60 frames, because then you can do slow motion and uh, our kids love the slow motion. Good guy. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh... The uh, <laughs> iPhone 14, if you try to go to ProRes uh, HDR in 4K 60, it won't let you. And then in 30, it'll say uh, freeing resources. So mine is still, this whole time has been sitting here trying to free up resources. So if you're trying to shoot kids, that moment would have been long gone. <laughs> so don't even try it uh, unless you turn everything off and don't have any apps open. So just something to know about the 14. It still hasn't finished freeing up resources on my phone. So good to know. Yeah, I, I will say that I think that one of the things that's interesting is Apple jumped about three years ahead in one update uh, with the um, 15. Between the difference between, I have a 14 and a 15, and the difference between the 14 and the 15, I love l watching um, one of the discussions, of course, around the Apple, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, trying to break up the Apple store and, and a lot of what the DOJ is doing is they said that Apple's not innovating. And, and my only thing is the only thing people care about is the camera. And, and if you watch the, how fast the camera has gotten better in the last three, three versions, Apple spending a lot of money where it counts, you know? And so, um, but for the pro on the 14, which is a great, still a great camera. Um, I would say I would, for family stuff, I, I generally just leave it on, you know, I put it on 4k 60 and let it run. Um, and I don't, I don't worry too much about it when I go, oh, this is a moment that I'm going to want to do something with it, or I care about or something like that. Sometimes I'll shift to, to raw, you know, and, or I'll grab, I'll usually open the black magic camera and, and record log, you know, like I, I really will shift gears and go, I'm going to capture this, but it's not going to be, I'm going to capture a bunch of stuff and it's going to, we'll see how it goes. It's like, this is going to something I actually want to use my daughter playing her first concert or, you know, something like that, or, you know, whatever it is. So I shift gears uh, back and forth. I also like to shoot with the Blackmagic camera. I use my kids as, as test cases. A lot of times I'm shooting stuff and I'm shooting with the Blackmagic camera, not because I need to, but because I want to and I want to figure out, um, you know, I'm, I, the best way to learn how to use that camera, there are so many options, is to use it. <laughs> so, so a lot of times I'm using home videos as a way to learn how the camera wants to react to things and how I put it in. And there, it's a lot of overkill. My, my kids have strict limits on how much gear I'm allowed to bring to one of their, their events. Um, you know, so I have to be very careful about how far I push that. Um, but the, um, uh, but I think that, uh, I, I, I like using anywhere I can train to train. So I, I do use it that way. I will warn you that it takes up an enormous amount of space. I mean, I, I shot one song, my daughter's in a rock, couple rock bands and I shot one song with her playing. And it was 38 gigs. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, on, a, on, a, on an iPhone. So, so you just have to know that these, these, and then people immediately after the show ask you for the file and you're like, well, I got to take the file back to resolve. I got to apply a LUT. I got to then export it out. I got to convert it to H.264. So it took a couple, a day or two for me to get it to everybody. And everyone's, you know, impatient because they texted me all the videos, of course, that night. So that's the, that gets back into sharing. Um, next question. Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia is up next. I purchased a few months ago an LG 43-inch TV UR80. Should I use it as a background or stay with the gray wall since I'll not have my bookcase behind me anymore? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Uh, you can use it in the background. I wouldn't make it be your only background because 43 inches isn't probably enough to fill the background. Uh, if you want to put, you know, a ersatz background behind you, 
you could just use it as a set piece behind you and put a nice picture, static picture of something you'd see out a window, let's say, that's not moving and not distracting. You may have to adjust your uh, lighting to accommodate it because it might be a little too bright for your lighting if you're working with fairly low key lighting. And you don't want your camera, um, if your lighting is too bright, uh, your camera will change its shutter angle or shutter speed and that can cause the background uh, led uh, uh led backlight in the 43 inch monitor to flicker sometimes so you have to balance that stuff out but it could be uh, a little more attractive than a gray wall behind you uh and a little more interesting but put it far enough behind you so that the bokeh of the camera keeps it a little bit out of focus so we're not too distracted by whatever's on go ahead ronnie yeah one other thing is this this place kind of big so it will probably uh be covered by your uh, your body so depending on how far back you would put it uh as i remember your your back wall is not that far away from you so you will probably have the display kind of showing uh some part to the side of your body and then it will probably be hidden also a little bit so make sure the composition is uh, is very well made and as courtney said Reflection can be a big problem on these. They have highly reflective um, uh, glass in front of them. So it could pose a really, really big problem to, to adjust uh, the lighting. And if you are uh, seeing that, you can use um, cinefoil or just a cardboard uh, or, or gaffer's tape to flag off the, the reflection from the light that you would like to control and and uh, make sure that it only hits your face and and your body and not the the, the display behind you. next question next one comes to us from douglas carmichael is there any benefit to the m3 max versus the m3 pro for audio workflows go ahead, jason okay try as i may i've looked and looked and um no i'm sorry they're they're just isn't they're so fast <laughs> i go ahead carl yeah, so as Jason said, um, no. So even like the M1 Vanilla, when that first came out, when the Mac Mini came out, um, friends of the show, Nick Bat, did a test with Logic to see how many of the most expensive um, processor and expensive plugins you could use. So how many, how many simultaneous tracks could you run simultaneously in Logic? And it was over 100. That was on the M1 Vanilla. So the M3 Pro and the M3 Max, no. The big difference between the two is kind of graphics. Um, and memory bandwidth, so the actual bus speed. So, but audio is such a lightweight application for computers that no, so no, there's, there's no difference. You're just wasting money for something that's good at 3D graphics, but not for audio. All right, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, one thing you might want to stay away from the Max for is uh, fan noise because the you know higher powered the processor, the more fan noise, and it's fairly subtle. The fans are very subtle on both of those. Um, and I don't think, uh, uh, you know, unless you're going to be rendering video in the background while you're doing your audio, uh, that might be a consideration if the uh, M3 studio is right in front of you, you know, near, near an open microphone, that might be a consideration. But I think the, uh, the pro is plenty, as the other two people said. As someone with a studio and uh, six Mac minis on my desk, I have never heard them. I, I think to pick them up on a mic, you might have to like actually put a mic against where the air is coming out <laughs> like you know so it's it's a like nothing makes any noise it's 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 quite a thing um uh next question next one comes to us from tony mobley in noonan georgia again i have a zoom h6 that i use in my setup but i also have a scarlet solo that was gifted to me should i switch out the zoom h6 for the solo ronnie i would say no i'm pretty sure the h6 is uh provided with a better preamp than the solo and that is basically uh, based on the fact that I have a lot of Scarlets and their, their preamps are not really good. Right. Next question. Next question comes to us from Chuck Hodges in Tulome, California. Group we work with has 10 meter by 10 meter booth at the largest slow in our industry, a three meter by 10 meter booth at a satellite show later, all in partnership with the show. So the internet is under the master account. I'm asking about actual numbers for this NAB booth, please. Go ahead, Guy. 
Yeah, they're all going to be different. You can't really compare the Las Vegas Convention Center versus the Seattle Convention Center. I mean, you can get kind of within range, but they're so dramatically different because some they have different rules as far as load in, load out. If it's Freeman picking that thing up, or can you put your own truss in? Can you buy an 80 inch TV? Can you wheel it in with your minivan and park out front? I, at CES, I saw a lot of these guys just running across the floor with because they allowed it at the Eureka Park where I was at. So my experience is uh, in the last year, I've had to buy a couple of these booths and set them up so it's carpeting it's uh you know or various flooring that you can get but carpeting is going to cost money the padding how thick is that padding you walk into some booths and it's like whoa luxurious if you're going to be standing in that booth for three days you want that extra padding and i'm willing to pay 800 bucks more for the padding as far as real numbers i mean it, again it depends do you want the internet uh do you what speed internet do you want uh is there uh, 5G in there, like the last place I was at, our 5G worked better than our 4G bonded. So 5G with one modem worked better. Um, what else? Yeah, power. Do you need 20 amp circuit, 10 amp circuit? Can you get away with that? Where do you want those runs in advance? How many of them? And then people, like how many people do you need to man that booth? Are you going to rotate through them? There's there's just a lot going on. It, you, you can't compare what we're doing versus uh, and then also, if you're a member of an organization, there'll be discounts for, is this your first year, your second year? Are you sometimes you get half off just for being a member uh, and not just a one-off for that event and you get better booth positioning if you come here so there, there's a lot to it jack <laughs> hey good ronnie yeah and a uh, region is also uh, uh something that has to do with pricing uh if you are in the states of course you have some people that have to do some types of jobs that we've seen uh, from the NAB, etc. If you're in Europe, the situation is a little bit different. And depending on the city in Europe and uh, the center you are at, it's uh, very different uh, if you can do everything yourself or if you have to rent people to, to do the, the jobs. Yeah, it, it is. There's no way to give you a hard number. Um, you know, like it, it, as everyone said, it's as someone who's working through it right now there's no way to give you a hard number like it it because it just keeps on and you won't even know what the number is until you get until the show ends you know like it's gonna you have to kind of just buffer you know into that but i know i can tell you that um i worked with another company that had a that had a booth that was not as big as the one you're talking about that is a uh no actually about the same 30 yeah it may be a little bit bigger actually um than, than your booth nicely set up a uh, high-tech booth and i can tell you that their budget was seven million dollars you know, so it was a 40 by 40. Um, that's the construction. That is the people. That's all the costs of getting it in there. This is not like a basic, like I'm going to put up some tables. This is like, there's like little, little rooms in there and things like that. And you can go in and there's a meeting room upstairs and there's a, there's a, you know, area to look at things downstairs and, you know, but it was $7 million, you know, to do that. And I know that for some of the stuff, some, some organizations have chosen to like rent out a bar for the entire show instead of a booth and it's cheaper you know like to rent a bar at the mgm for the entire length of the show and just have people come over and meet with you and have a bunch of stuff set up in the bar and do all those other things was cheaper than actually having a booth so when the, especially when you get into that kind of scale now i will say if you have the right product that people want to see and people are going to look at and people can touch on it, it it's an really important um, place to be the expo, you know, the amount of foot traffic and the amount of people that are interested and the amount of purchases that I've decided on based on being at an expo is incredibly valuable. So I don't want to say that it's not worth being on the floor because it's very much we're on the floor. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it's very much, uh, worth doing, but you have to have your business model figured out. Like, why are you doing it? What are you doing it for? What do you hope to get out of it? It may not be that you're trying to get pure sales. It may be something that you're trying to get. Um, you're trying to make a bunch of contacts that'll turn into sales. You're trying to, you know, build your brand. You're trying to do a bunch of other things. But what I really, what really hurts is you'll see some people who obviously paid a bunch of money for this booth and they didn't really know what they were going to do. And there's just nobody at their booth, you know, and, and, and then they're just sitting there empty and you really have to think about how are you drawing people in? And it can't just be candy at, at the, in the front. Like it, you know, like that's the real much it, it is. I will say, um, it's not a bad way to get people to at least slow down is to have uh, mints, mints, mints are the best one. In my opinion is everybody's concerned about their breath because they're walking around. They're not eating enough. They've got halitosis. They've got all this other stuff. Everyone's subconscious, you know, conscious are worried about that. Individually wrapped mints are really popular. <laughs> you know, so you'll, you'll, you'll stop at a lot of those things. Um, uh, go ahead, guy. 
Yeah, and then whatever you budget, uh, add another 20 to 30% contingency on top of that because you're going to get smacked with something and it's going to hurt later if you only budgeted a certain amount. Um, The other thing to keep in mind is, as uh, Alex was saying, uh, what's your goal? Are you trying to get contacts? Because if you are, there's another expense called a badge scanner and uh, you can get the ones uh, that they'll rent you or you can get the ones that uh, you operate on your phone. So be thinking about things like that in adva- well in advance because you don't want to hit day of show because a lot of that stuff gets way more expensive. I think Alex is figuring this out right now that if you do not book this stuff in advance, yeah. it becomes twice as expensive. The, the internet is the big one. Like that was the one and I did get it in time. There was no way we could afford to do it if we didn't, if we hadn't got, we got right down a couple days before the deadline not the deadline but a couple days before we we pe- tracked that one very closely the other costs have been uh i may have lost 15 percent by being late but it wasn't like a big it wasn't double um the the one that was double was the internet <laughs> like and that was that was a that was one that we just had to make the deal um but the other ones have been incremental it's been you know maybe 10 or 15 percent difference um, power and uh some of the labor some of those things are not as expensive um if you uh um you know, they're not that, they're a little bit more expensive, but not a lot more. Right, go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was just going to make a small comment on the fact that when Alex said it was $7 million, the budget came through like that. You got to remember that in some cases at the floor at NAB, they are selling things that are so expensive. And I remember the old days when you would be able to find somebody selling you a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter fully equipped for video for a news station. One sale in that can easily dwarf anything else. So if, you know, that's when you get the two-story building or two-story built out booth spaces with a staircase up to the top so they can take a sales process, move them up into a private place, answer all of them questions, so serve them coffee and close on a sale of that magnitude. And suddenly the cost of the booth disappears and that kind of thing. That's not every booth, but that's part of what a trade show like NAB was about. You do have to you know, be conscious of what your sale price is and what you need to do to break even. And, and again, it's not always that you have to break even that day, but you will, you know, some penny pinchers will say you have to break even that week. And that's crazy talk, you know, like, you know, like they're not, they're not re- relating to reality. You know, they are, you know, what you're doing is you're building a bunch, but you do have to figure out what is that going to be? What is that impact going to be? Now we're in a very odd place because we are not trying to necessarily, um, sell anything, <laughs> you know, other than. You know, we have a booth. It's we're the maybe the only booth in the central hall that is inward facing outward, which is that is that we are um, we want we just need a space on the floor to transmit from. You know, so we had this discussion I think the other day where people were like, "Well, how do you know what do we do with people behind us, or can we put a monitor out for folks?" And I'm like, "No, I don't want people. Like, I, I just need someone to know where to go to sit down. You know, to sit down. I don't. We're not trying to attract big crowds uh, because that'll make it harder for us to do what we do." And so, um, and so we're in a very odd position where we need that because we need a, an internet point to, to project zoom to a wireless camera. That's the number one reason we need to be on, have a, have a space. So, um, so our situation is very different than other people's. And we've been very, again, very fortunate to have, um, you know, great, um, you know, great support from NAB and from zoom, as well as, uh, partners like Sony, uh, VizLink, LiveU, Electrosonic, you know, they're all, um, uh, been, been providing us a lot of hardware to make sure that this actually works. So stay tuned. Next question. Next one comes to us from Ignacio Madero in Madrid. Hi guys, more than a question. It is a comment. I'd love to see a second hour dedicated to Peplink and its technology applied to live streaming. Have a great day. Yeah, go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, me too. Uh, there is a guy in Germany that has done a lot of uh, testing with Peplinks. And if I'm not very mistaken, we will also be using Peplink at NAB, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, I, um, I have a Peplink in my house right now. Um, and what we did is we have, we have the Sony, so we're using the, uh, Sony FR sevens for the booth. And so Kevin got all the Sony set up with all the lenses and everything else. And then we tied them into the network and then we hooked the Peplink up to the internet and then we left it alone and said, Jonas, here it is. <laughs> and, and, and I said, Jonas, what do we need? What do we need to, um, actually, uh, connect, you know, like w- what do I need to do to set up the router? Um, uh, uh, so that I, so that you can run it. And, and he was like, I just, I just need the serial number. So I just took a picture of the bottom of the router and sent it to Jonas and that was it. And, and, uh, and the next day I got a picture back from one of the cameras going, Oh, look at the back your backyard. <laughs> so, so anyway, so that, so, and so, uh, so Jonas has set it all up now so that, and, and again, this is the advantage of us having the cameras for a week before the, the show 
is that we're trying to get everything all sorted out before we get there. But it's a really, I have to admit that I've been a Meraki person for 15 years. I've, people have said that. And I was like, oh, the Pepper League is pretty good. You know, like it's, it's, a, it's, it's much more cost effective. Um, and uh, with someone who knows how to use it, it's, it's pretty good. So Jonas is doing a great job at that. And we'll definitely show you both us using it. But, you know, we're going to break down what we did at NAB the, the, at the end of the week. Um, so you'll be able to see all the things and we'll, we'll give you diagrams and everything that, everything it took to do it. We'll talk, we'll talk to that at the end of the end of next week. Uh, go ahead, guy. Yeah, I was in the show with, uh, Tucker over the weekend and we were talking about these cause he's Jonas's partner and they have quite a few of these deployed out in the field. And I was wondering which one to get. And so this would be a great second hour. If you put it in the discord and we can vote it up, I'd let because I stopped by their booth at CES, uh, not last year, the year before, and I didn't know their line was that extensive. But the one that Tucker was telling me about that's new is called the B1. It's 599 bucks, And there's a lot of new interact uh, interrupt operability with uh, Starlink. So these things are built now because there's a lot of RVers out there that want to bond uh, multiple Starlinks or Starlink with their cellular. And so there's there's a lot of stuff that we could talk about in the second hour. So I'm excited if you want to put that in Discord, yeah. uh, I'll load it up. Yeah, let's, let's the tech team, the, the infrastructure team on Fridays, let's figure out when we can put that link in. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Is the use of promotional videos before a, sh a trade show an effective method to drive booth traffic? And what other PR methods might we see this week? Good, Carl. So this was something that was done. They usually used to do product trailers, but don't give out the specs. So they'd say the trailer, they'll give you like dot points of where that fit into like an industry. Canon used to do this quite a lot. Um, and they'll do it like in the day or two leading up to NAB. And then you'd have to go to the booth to actually get the specs. So you have to speak to like the sales and the engineers. Um, and Godox is actually doing it now as well. So Godox has stuff that's not on the website, but does show up as special order on B and H, but it doesn't show up in a, in a search. So if you search, like if you categorize search on B and H, it won't show up. You have to actually know the model number and it's like, you know, two months out. So they're actually having broadcast lights Godox now has, but they're not promoting them because they're actually sold out to broadcasters, broadcasters are buying these things by the hundreds. So they're not actually selling them to the public yet until they've filled all their back orders to to broadcasters now broadcasters get emails directly from godox saying hey we got these products available they're fanless they're very powerful um they don't come with power cables because grids don't have power cables grids have their own cabling so they just give you the little sockets and you just simply wire them yourself so there's this whole series of broadcast lights from godox which will be at, i'm guessing they'll be there at um neb but they're not promoting them at all and they you have to kind of know their model number to find them on any website to buy and you can't buy them anyway because it's still two months out, but they they are they have been selling it for three months, but only to people who are on their mailing list or like yep. big purchases. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. There's kind of two schools of thought on on this. Uh, if you have a booth at NAB, let's say, uh, you either want to uh, uh, do teaser videos beforehand that are just released. You know, you know, coming new, a new new version of this or see our new products at at a booth and mention the booth number in your teaser videos to drive uh, traffic to the booth. And then you announce at the show itself. But the problem is a lot of companies announce new products uh, at the show in keynotes and other means of press releases and have press conferences where they announce new products. But you kind of get lost in the moray of all the new, uh, the morass of all the new uh, product announcements. So some companies choose to announce products the week before and then uh, and show all the features and stuff to drive traffic to the booth to want to lay hands on it and see it. So there's two schools of thought there and which one works the best to drive booth traffic. Uh, I'm, I, think, uh, the, I think the teaser trailer, you know, the teaser announcement does more to drive booth traffic because you're interested, but they don't reveal too much so that you... Uh, sit at home and you go, well, I don't even need to go because I know all about uh, the new products that are going to be released already. So, you know, there's that problem. Yeah. I mean, we've done a lot of launches at NEB and CES and the, the thing that it, I don't have data, but the thing that it's been told to us is the most successful is a full launch the week before people have already committed to going to the event, you know, like in Vegas. So they've already bought tickets. They've already bought, they're not coming because of your product or whatever. They're going to, they're going to be at the, at the event anyway. Um, and what you're, and basically it's too much energy to do two launch events. And so you just do the launch event. And the problem is, is that once you get into NAB, there's too much noise. 
So the the noisy weeks are the two weeks before, uh, and you're seeing that today. This this so DGI is doing something on Wednesday. There's other people. For, uh, Black Magic is releasing on Friday. Um, so everyone's kind of releasing these things, and what they want to do is they they're softening the ground and making sure that you know as much as you need to know, and then you're going to want to come and look at it and play with it and talk to people about it. That's you know, and and it and it makes it so that you're not what they. What I've been told is they don't, they, th there was a very popular thing of giving you part of the, the data. And then th the idea was it was going to draw you to the booth. And what it did is it, dr it drowns the engineers. So, so the, um, the, the reason they've moved away from that is to, because the engine, everyone keeps on coming up and asking for the specs or asking for what it does. And they want you to know all those things before you get there. Um, you know, and so because they don't have enough manpower to actually manage people asking the basic questions, they want you to get all the basic questions out of the way. And then come and ask the questions that you have that are specific to it. So uh, it was completely right. It's very, very popular. It was very, very popular. Um, I think in general, uh, trying to minimize marketing manipulation and maximize use is is usually the best best approach. And so uh, releasing th something the week before with video, I think, is the way to do this. Like it, you don't you don't want to do announcements, in my opinion, on the week of NAB. It doesn't give people enough time to think about it. Um, you really want to do it the week before. Um, and that's the, um, people really get it, you know, old marketing still gets into kind of a caught up in the, in the, in the, that, that process, but it's, a it's the, 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 most of the modern marketing is doing it the week before full, full on videos, full launches, everything frame IO is doing one tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so I think it's tomorrow is the big frame IO. And then you have DGI and then you have black magic. You'll see some other announcements coming out. But those are the ones, you know, embargoing them towards the, to the actual day means that you're now in the mix of everything else. It's really problematic. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. When created, creating a consistent workflow, how many iterations did you need to make it work for your specific task? Good, Carl. So it's not necessarily iterations. Um, I have essentially sometimes more mentally and or sometimes I write it down. It's more of a decision tree. So decision trees are really important um, for all the types of jobs that I do. I kind of do quite a varied jobs and kind of varied sizes too. So decision tree allows me to just hear the specs of the job that's, that's coming in. And sometimes I'll just have like a location, amount of people, um, and the type of product they want at the end of it. And then I have to go through my decision tree and decide like what I need to bring, my time frame to set up, you know, all that kind of stuff, and my workflow in post-production as well. So a decision tree can be active um actively change so you don't have to have like a fixed one we have to iterations where you think this is the best process there is a decision tree can have multiple processes with multiple outcomes um and it can be a, a living document so you don't have to think there's only one way and if you actually kind of get into that rigid one way you're losing a lot of business because you're going to be kind of um coaxing yourself out of business because you it doesn't fit into your workflow where if you have a decision tree you have a you know essentially infinite workflows that you can possibly do Jesse? Um, if you want consistent workflow, you need to stop iterating because iterations are inherently inconsistent. But for our workflows, we uh, never stop iterating because the, the second that you stop iterating, you haven't stopped, whether it's your uh, competition or your collaborators, everybody who's working in your field is still iterating, which means that they are pulling ahead. So you aren't stopped. You're actually moving backwards when you stop iterating on your workflows. Go ahead, Bill. What everybody said, your gear keeps changing, your software keeps changing, your skills hopefully keep improving, which means that even though you want to set a deadline and get your workflow locked in so everything functions correctly, it's a constant adaptation from that point on to make sure that you're doing the latest and the best. Next question. David Brady in New York City, what are some of the requirements for NDI Bridge? We're starting to build out some infrastructure at work and bridging the gap with remote contribution? would be good good guy depends on what you're trying to do the actual bridge machine doesn't need much uh, horsepower at all it depends on the joiner side and uh, where it's going because uh, on the joiner side um, it, you're exposing your network you can either in access manager you can say who who you want to see those feeds otherwise if you say public it'll be everything on your network and they'll see everything and then it depends on that little slider if you want to do medium quality or you could say do not transcode at all and then there's no hit whatsoever. But if you want to do, let's say, 6 1080p feeds, you just watch it and you could see, uh, open up Task Manager and you can see how much it's it's pulling because basically you're, you're, you're saying, I want this either in HEVC, which then having a uh, powerful GPU will be uh, something that you'll need. And it'll tell you when you launch, it'll say, 
uh, you do not, uh, there'll be a green checkbox or a red checkbox if you do not have an appropriate graphics card to be able to encode in that flavor. Uh, so if you're just doing H.264, you could probably get away with a pretty weak machine. HEVC at a higher bit rate, because you can crank that sucker all the way up to, I think it's 24 megabit um, at uh, 4K is with the biggest one that I did. And that I could see it saturate my resources pretty quick. So it depends again on the video, how many streams, and then where they're at and uh, on the network, if they're actually across country or they're, where, where are you going? Where are you, where are you pushing those things from as to how much bandwidth, how big of a nick that you're going to need to, to push that across the country? Yeah, stay tuned. We definitely plan to part, be partnering with Viz to do a lot more NDI work after NAB. So um, we'll be talking to them, of course, at NAB. So build up your questions for that. When you see that happening, we'll be at their booth. Um, but we do, do plan to do a lot more NDI work as we go after NAB with, um, with the company. So stay tuned for that and be ready to jump into those labs and into those uh, second hours. Next question. Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland's up next. I regularly use Shutter Encoder. What will the new FFmpeg version mean to me, and when am I likely to see it introduced to Shutter Encoder? Go ahead, Ronnie. Well, uh, easily said, uh, it will break some workflows and it will make other workflows work a lot better. Um, when it will be implemented is uh, not easy to say. This is a donationware, so it's kind of free for everyone and it's based on donations and i know if you keep donations coming probably you could sponsor maybe an implementation of this uh, but um the previous implementation of new technology into this tool has been kind of varying in time so i wouldn't cross my fingers and and see it uh, come this week or next week um another thing you could could of course do is to shoot the question uh, into the reddit group they have it's really really um uh, active so uh, i'll guess you get a little bit uh, better answer there next question next one comes from david brady in new york city and david says following up on ndi bridge we have a corporate firewall to deal with would the lift be easier if bridges were off prem rather than co uh, kowtowing for infosec go ahead uh, jason it's difficult to know exactly how uh, how tricky your infosec is going to be but yes if you know this is one of the reasons that we've talked so much about in the cloud yes if you have these these very high bandwidth things that have their own specific rules a lot of the time assuming you've got the bin bandwidth in and out um you're going to be better off trying to get them off site what do you think guy good guy yeah, the only way I've seen really to get around this is to use Bird Dog Cloud. They have some security stuff. Otherwise, you need it's port fifty nine ninety, and if you don't have it open, it just locks it. it. Just says cannot connect. And so I don't know what the infosex part of it would be, but I've been able to get around it with Bird Dog Cloud. Also, look at Magewell Cloud as well if you're if you really want to get into this. Those are the two players that that have done some kind of turn server that they can route around these things and not expose any any. Uh, open ports on your big corporate network to where your security guys are like, um, hey, there's some we want to talk about you opening up that port over there and letting, you know, everybody in the world in. Everybody loves uh, when you um, throw, uh, what, everybody, everybody loves when you open up port. They're, they're always big fans of that in IT. They're just like, yeah, sure, that's going to be great. <laughs> uh, let me, let me, do you want me, do you want all of them opened or do you just want these ones open? I mean, you want to be picky or that's, that's usually how these conversations begin. Um, anyway, next question. Isn't there an open all button? Uh, Graham Cardwell, Belfast, Northern Ireland. I'm compressing an 80 minute sports match video from 20 gigabytes down to two gigabytes for WeTransfer's free option. Would you use a higher bit rate in 720p or a lower bit rate in 1080p? Go ahead, Carl. Always 1080. So you always want to have the higher resolution. If you know your output file is going to be two gig, regardless of like whatever the resolution is, if you think you're going to get, you won't get better quality out of 720, because that's only one megapixel. One megapixel, uh, you know, essentially that means you're going to have twice the data rate, but you'll actually, you got to understand modern compression. So MPEG-2 maybe back on DVD, that was true, but with um, H.265, that's not the case anymore. So always give it the higher raster. So 1080, if, you, if your original is 1080, then yeah. But if your original is, you know, you're saying that it's 20 gig, but if that's an MPEG-4 file, and you're going down to another 10 times compression, just be aware you will see macro blocking show up. Um, you can set it to the slower setting, like best quality setting in, in a compressor. Um, you can also do best quality setting, even in iMovie and stuff like that. Um, but just be aware, if you're going from a highly compressed format, and you're doing a 10 times compression again, be aware it will look, regardless of what resolution you do, it's gonna look funny. But if you're going from ProRes or something higher, 
down, then that should be okay. But two gigabytes for 80 minutes should be quite fine. That's kind of what um, uh, iTunes movies were back in the day. That's about the same quality they were, which was about five to six meg. Go ahead, Jesse. And please remember to do two-pass encoding. It will create much better results. Yeah, especially when you're pushing hard. So when you're when you're pushing it hard, uh, two pass doesn't matter as much when you're when you're just doing something that's a, a that's a light encode, but a heavy encode you de definitely want to take the time to get it down there. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I would not do this just to get into fit into a free re re retransfer free option. <laughs> like I would find some way to pay pay something um, that is a small amount of money uh, to put up a larger file. Like I would not uh, I I would not um I would not do what you're doing. Like I, I, you know, just to, just to, just to fit into it. If, if there was a client requirement of being two gigs, that's one thing, but I would spend $15 or $10 or something to, to, you know, get it, even if it's open it for a month and close it, uh, to make that happen, I would do that uh, before I would, um, before I would spend the time, you know, cause it's just, this is going to take time to figure out how to do it well. Um, so, you know, that's the, um, but I'm, I have to admit that I'm pretty stingy about time. Um, so the, um, uh, I would look at the file i would probably let it run all night and i'd run it on 720p and 1080p as two different codes and i'd come back and look at what i got um, in fact i'd probably have a bunch of different mixes the, the thing you have to deal with is quality of pixels over number of pixels and so you may find that the 720 just looks nicer even scaled up because of the macro blocking especially if you have a lot of camera movement you have a sport this is a sports event you may see a lot of breakup at 1080p that you would not see at 720p um, and so you may find that the 720 pays off for this specific thing. Um, so, uh, so you know, you just really want to pay attention to the quality of those pixels. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. When lighting for Zoom, what's preferred, light panels or soft boxes? Go ahead, Jesse. For Zoom and beyond, we always go with soft boxes. When you get a panel, you've got your 12 inch by 12 inch panel. It's always going to be 12 inches by 12 inches, and uh, it's kind of got that maximum brightness that if you add more diffusion, it just kills it too much. So we always go with a high-powered LED spot and then whatever size softbox we want in front of that. Not always, but that's our general workflow. Carl? Yeah, so up until very recently, softbox is the way to go. So you'd have like a CAB point source light going into a softbox. Um, it's the cheapest option. Um, but recently in the last 12 months, um, there's a few manufacturers. Godox has released a two thousand dollar four by four. So this is humongous. This is the size of a wall. It's a flat panel. It's you know it's essentially it folds up. It's, it's semi rigid. Um, but this is designed for film set, music videos, commercials. It's not really designed for YouTubers, but it is humongous. They do have a two by two, a two by four, and a four by four. But we're talking multiple thousands of dollars for these. Um, with a soft box, soft box costs you fifty to hundred dollars for a soft box, and the light will cost you you know. 100 to 200 dollars for a powerful light you remember you do have to have a relatively powerful light kind of softbox because it's going to cut your life in half instantly with just one diffusion if you do double diffusion it's going to cut it by probably about one and a half stop but yeah softbox is the way to go it's very flexible you can pack it down easy to travel so it's lighter too oh sorry uh go ahead jason yeah i mean softboxes are always going to be better and if you want to go one above uh something like this a lantern will will give you really really soft light that's that's the the step up from from the soft box I, uh go ahead courtney depends on how much money you want to spend i think for a zoom uh if you're at a desk and you have limited amount of space a soft box or a big umbrella is going to take up a lot of space as you can see when when jason showed his setup there uh with that giant umbrella <laughs> light uh diffuser in front of it i i like the newer you know they're cheap uh these newers are like 90 or this is a 12.9 like uh, jesse was saying but they're compact they're dual color they have the light they have built-in batteries so in case you have a power outage and you've got a ups on your computer but you usually won't have enough to power the lights off your ups these batteries will take over and uh you can power them off of ac it has a clamp that goes on the desk there so you can use it to uh fit into a compact situation and they're only you know they're under a hundred bucks a piece sometimes i got two of them for under a hundred bucks and they have plenty of light output i have one lighting up this side of uh, this side of my face against the sun that is coming through here that hasn't quite eclipsed yet uh so <laughs> they have a definitely and i'm set at about 10 percent power on um, this one up here that's doing the fill light so it has plenty of oomph to get out you know. jesse 
And regarding price, if you go with a soft box and you're only going to set it up for Zoom and leave it there, you can go cheap. If you're planning to move it, tear it down, rebuild it more than once a year, do not cheap out on the soft boxes. I cheaped out on the soft box. I'll let you know what I have. Um, I, I don't have a way to shoot. I'm working on being able to shoot this in the from behind, but um, I have a, uh, I took a, I have two NAND lights, uh, 68, B, 68, uh, 68 Bs. Um, and uh, so they're about 250 each. So they're a little bit larger. You could totally, in this case, the NAND lights are very convenient, but they're turned way down. So you could probably use a, a, a little one panel. And, and then I, what I did is I built a five by three box that happened to fit. It just happened to be the, the size that I needed it for this. Um, and I did it all with, uh, um, with maker pipe. So these are little, little cases. So the entire box, I bought some diffusion on Amazon. Um, the whole box probably cost 50 bucks, you know, with the EMT rail that I use. So the box is $50, the, then whatever lights you want to put behind them, whether those are, um, light panels or, or Godox or, or, um, uh, you know, any, you know, NAN light is what I, I have a lot of NAN light. So that's why, that I, that's why I put back there. As you move the lights away, they get softer, but they're all behind this. So they're basically, you're moving it out and what you're creating is a big box that is evenly lit from a, and you can decide whether mine is lit well. I mean, you can decide whether I'm lit well, but I like it. <laughs> so, so it's, so, but it's a giant box. Um, and I think it looks better than what I've had in the past. Um, the key is, is that as you, as you work, you just want to make sure that, you know, if, if I have this box here like this, as I move the lights away, they're going to more, more evenly light this back area. I just don't want them to spill out. Um, and then, then this becomes the big box. And I think most people, even when we're doing models, we have four by fours on either side of them. Um, you know, like most people look better with big soft lights. It tends to fill in a lot of stuff. Um, and so you know, again, mine's an installation, so it's my office. Um, if you're trying to move into something, you might use something that's a lighter soft box that you throw in and then you put up and everything else. Mine actually doesn't take as much space as a soft box would typically take at that size. Um, and it would be a lot more expensive to do it some other way. You know, so if you're building something out and I highly recommend if you spend, if you do what we do, or you spend a lot of time talking to folks is to find a room in your house that you're going to turn into a place that you're going to work, that you're not going to be setting up all the time. Um, and you're, this is the place that you jump into video meetings. Um, it really changes how people interact with you when you have a good setup. Um, it's worth it. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, I just want to make a note. If you're going to go with speed boxes and I do, I have a, I have a soft box up ahead and then a couple of little panels for uh, little OB kind of eye lights. But remember that most of the time you're going to need some sort of uh, speed ring to go on around the camera lens or whatever you're shooting from. And so it takes a little bit of time to figure out what is the mounting system for my softbox? What is the speed ring I need? How am I going to mount the speed ring to a stand or to the camera or whatever you're putting it on? So it just takes a little time to figure this all out. Perfectly possible to do. And speed, uh, softboxes are great because they're travelable, as everybody said, but they're a bit complex in that sense. I have to admit that I don't like using soft boxes on the road because I find them to be difficult to figure out where to put them. And there's all this racking. I tend to use larger LEDs. Um, when I'm, I use a uh, light pads, which are these like four, they're like flexible. You can roll them up. Um, and they're, uh, they go four by fours. Um, and uh, I use, we use those when we're remote. Um, I just don't like dealing with this exactly what bill just said <laughs> so as a result i almost never use them um uh, like on the road tents, and then, those bendy bendy and then, poles yeah, just, or it's too much fiddling the tail. Um, usually you know so so i i usually want big sources that i'm going to use when i that are just as soon as you pick them up they're doing what they need to do um yeah uh next question kenny hampton in greenville illinois will you give the cliff notes version of what is pep link is this a new manufacturer and uh, re relatively quick guy we're running out of time yeah the the little baby ones are just eSIM and basically they, uh, the travel routers essentially, but the bigger ones that we're talking about are, are, uh, multiple SIMs and then multiple ways of hooking ethernet in so that we can speed fusion, uh, and bond these connections in the cloud or fail over. But most of the time we're talking about bonding, but drop by their website and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Excellent. Um, coming up uh, next, we're going to be talking about the eclipse, about our coverage. Of course we have coverage here. Just a quick reminder that we have uh, we do have coverage uh, of the eclipse later today. That'll start at 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Uh, Bill and I uh, will be um, talking to a bunch of other folks uh, on, and then we have a ton of people in the field. Uh, and we'll be talking about a little bit about how we're doing that in the, uh, in the second hour. 
Um, but we've got people um, all up the spine of the of the field, and then we're also working with time and date, and we're working with a bunch of other folks. So, so it's going to be a pretty interesting, um, uh, pretty interesting day later today. We're going to see how this goes. A lot of cloud cover, <laughs> so so we're going to see how see see what that actually looks like. Of course, also uh, a quick reminder that we will be doing um, NAB next uh, uh, next week is going to be a big week for us. So. Um, NAB is, is, uh, all next week we'll be doing coverage, uh, every single day live. Um, and if you'd like to help us do that, uh, you can, uh, donate a little money officehours.global slash donate. Um, it's where it's a big, a big undertaking <laughs> that we're, that we're working on. So if, if, uh, if you're not volunteering, you're not on the panel, we'd, we'd love to have you donate officehours.global slash donate. All right. Welcome back. And uh, as I said, it's a big operation. <laughs> you know, so it's a big operation. We, uh, uh, we are, uh, eclipse, the eclipse is, has been, we've been working on it. We've been, we started meeting, I think six months ago, talking about it. Um, a lot of folks wanted it, like, what are we doing with the eclipse? And we're like, ah, we should cover it. Been, you know, it's been quite a road as we kind of work through a lot of the bits and pieces, um, of, of this, uh, to give you kind of a quick overview of, of what we've got is, and I don't know how many, uh, I think we, how many feeds are we pulling in, Dave? Can you, can you let us know that? We will have as few as 18 and as many as 28. Feeds. So that's. Depending on clouds. Yeah. Now, how many are we providing of those? Of those We're feeds? doing nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Then and we have 10 coming from space flight. And uh, right now we have about eight coming from uh, time and date. Yeah. So, so this is, and, and, you know, we want to thank uh, LiveX and, and Corey Benke. And uh, we're using the VVCR as is space flight. NASA space flight, as well as, 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 uh, as our team are using VVCR, which is the, uh, virtual video control room. Um, and this is what live X Corey was on a couple months ago and everything else. And I, I pinged Corey and said, Hey, is it, can we use VVCR for this? This is getting complicated. And he's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever we need. And they've been super supportive of everything we're doing. I would hi and it's really like, I think it was, it was fine to have Corey on to talk about it. Um, but it was really cool to see it get set up it's just so clean to set up feeds oh i want these feeds in here this is the kind of feed that i want this is where i want it to go um it's a really it's a really slick system so so that's that has been key to the operation for us um that that we've been able to um get the so all those feeds are going to vvcr and then um, that way they can be distributed back out so they're being sent to jeff keithley jeff keithley has um kindly uh, made his system available as you know our system is moving um, and we, you know, and so it's, uh, it's been a little bit more complicated to, to, for us to do it because we had to make that move. Um, and it's just hard to do more office, office hours than switch over in our system. And so Jeff was kind enough to, to, um, helm that. So he's going to be, um, so he, all those feeds. So basically all of our feeds all the way up the spine are, are going back to VVCR. We're also, we're then sending those feeds both to Jeff as well as um, to uh, time and date and to uh, NASA space flight. We're then getting their feeds. Now, time and date is sending us one, I think, and we select which one we want. Is that right, Dave? Well, actually, this morning, they got in touch with VVCR, and they're giving oh. us five clean feeds. Uh, there we go. So See? it's changed <laughs> over. Like when they saw what we were doing, and they said, yeah. why oh. aren't we on this? So we exactly. gave them the direct thing, and Corey's been hooking them up while we've been doing the show today. So, oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Oh, and again, we, we, we're so fortunate to have, uh, you know, uh, Corey supporting us, and his whole team has been really, really, really um, uh, supportive of what we're doing. They're yeah, excited Trevor to work and on Jeremy it. Jeremy have been great to us, yeah. Yeah. So, so they're, they're, they've been just, we're like, Hey, we need to cut more inputs and outputs. And they're like, yeah, sure. You know, like, you know, like we got this, you know, and we'll, we'll sort it out. So, so, um, uh, so, and it's, uh, uh, so, and we'll show you screen captures and we'll break it all down. You know, this is all, we're giving you a little preview of what we're doing. Um, but we will be, uh, you know, breaking this down of, of, of how it went, um, on Friday. So just so you know that on Friday, we're, we're going to come back and, and take a look at that. It is a, uh, if you are somewhere where there isn't a lot of clouds and you're somewhere nearby, you know, in the, to, you know, near the totality, if, if you're not near the totality, it's too late. You're not going to even be able to drive there. I, I don't even, I can't even imagine what the roads look like, especially if it's sunny, <laughs> you're not going to be able to go anywhere. Um, but if you're already there, um, you're already in a, in a place that, that works. Um, it is, you know, if you know, it's going over your house, I highly recommend checking it out as a, it's a, you know, once in a lifetime, uh, uh, experience. I was studying up for the show today and I was, the, you know, the longest time someone's experienced a, a, an eclipse. Do you know, do you know what that number is? Crazy number. 75 minutes. 
75 minutes. Wow. Now, that wasn't, now here's how they had to do that. They had to fly. They flew a uh, supersonic jet, you know, so they, they took, uh, <laughs> and they flew it down over Africa. And then in 1973, they went down over Africa and then they took a right, they took a left turn or whatever and just followed the, followed it. And it had to be, um, you know, had to be supersonic to, and they had scientists in there and everything else, but they were able to stay inside the totality for 75 minutes. Um, and, uh, and they had to hit it within a couple seconds, like to, to, to make the, the, the maneuver, they had to hit it in, in, in a couple seconds to get into it, into the flow anyway, that, so, um, so, but typically the totality, the last totality that we had was about two and a half minutes. Um, and the, the longest, I think totality, when you're just standing on the ground, you're not in a supersonic jet. Uh, and if you're, if you're not on the Concorde, which is what it was, it was a customized Concorde. Um, if you're not on that, then, uh, uh, then eight minutes is kind of the outer range. And that just depends on the position of the earth. I mean, the position of the moon, as it relates to the earth, as far as the distance of it, of how much of the, how long it covers the sun. Um, but the, um, anyway, but the, uh, um, it's a, it's a really fascinating phenomenon. Um, you know, we had one in, we, we were a little, I think people are not taking it for they're taking it for granted because we have we had one in 2017 we have one in 2024 next one is 2044 <laughs> like so it's gonna, in the united states it's gonna take a long time uh it, it happens about every 18 months somewhere in the world the next one i think is actually the very next one i think is greenland i think is the next one that's there and the cloud cover may be maybe heavy there we'll see um and then uh the next one after that i think is australia i think that that's i believe that australia is the one in 2028 um is the australian one so we're we're prepping for, for those ones. Um, I'm hoping I, I'd hope to go down to this one and I, uh, you know, just because of NAB being so close, I couldn't, I finally gave up <laughs> trying to do both of these shows at the same time. Um, and, uh, so, but I think that it's going to be interesting. We have different kits and Dave, do you know what all the kits are and the different locations? No, I'm not that versed on it, but most of them are going to be cameras, yep. uh, with long lenses. We, we had the opportunity to have some telescopes, but that, fell away so now we're compensating some people are putting up two cameras and some are just putting up the one yeah. uh, our tests have shown some beautiful shots so i, I think just the long lenses are working out and yeah it turns filters out filters on them are great yeah. i think for most for most of most of the uh uh camera about 400 millimeters is the most that you would need to to be able to fill up your frame so it's not like you have to have this giant lens or or anything else to do it so so that's there now again a reminder that if you're doing this today until you are in full totality, you need to keep that filter on. Um, so if you're shooting it, the filter has to stay on while you, until you get to totality. Once you get to totality, you won't see anything unless you take the filter off. <laughs> so, so anyway, so you have to take the filter off and then you're going to get it. And we did this for, uh, if you go back to the um, National Geographic had a, had a live stream of the, of the totality in 2017. And my team actually did that one. So, um, if you go back and watch that one, that's what, and Kevin Hansen, who works with us, um, he's the one that it was his telescope. It was a telescope, but it was, but we were able to then pop the, you know, pop the filter off and, and, uh, and get some great shots of what we were, what we were doing there, but you only need a camera to do that. Um, I mean, a camera with a 400 millimeter lens, you'll get the full frame. Uh, again, if you, I, this is a, there was a great, uh, I was, again, I was cramming, um, for la yeah, for this, um, over the weekend. One of the things that was pointed out is, is if, if this is your first eclipse, don't shoot it. You always shoot the second. I mean, like if you're on our team, please shoot it. Cause you're already, you're already lined up. <laughs> but, but if you're, um, if you're not on our team and you're not doing this for that, if you're watching this show and you're thinking, I'm going to go out and see the eclipse, unless you've done the prep that we've been doing, we've been talking about for the last six months and you've been thinking about it and you've been working through it. And many of the people that are shooting have been, have seen it before. Um, just experience it. Just, just look up and experience it. If you're not on the team, if you haven't been planning, if like you're thinking about it now, like, oh, well, maybe I'll take a picture. Your, your cell phone is not going to take anything worth looking at. You're never going to look at that again. Um, and if you're not good, if you're not really set up, you're not going to look at it. And you're, you're, you have the chance of damaging your equipment. And, you're, and the big thing is, remember, it's only going to last for four minutes. So at most, four and a half minutes, I think, is the max um, of totality. And so just experience it because it's just, an, it's a, I was fortunate enough that I had a whole team running the eclipse. So during the eclipse, I didn't have anything to do except for, for shoot 360 photos. So I, I mostly just watched the, watched the eclipse and um, it was really, it's really worth it. So um, I would, I would highly recommend it. But I think that, you know, basically all these feeds are coming back. We're doing SRT, I think for all of them. Is that, is that correct? Our, our delivery, Dave, is SRT to VVCR. Is that right? That's right. We have a couple of RTMPs, but that's, that's just two, I think. 
Yeah, so we have a handful of RTMPs and then the rest of them are S SRT um, uh, sending, going back to the um, VVCR and then being redistributed. I think that they're, they're RTMPs to uh, time and date. Is that right, Dave? And then um, SRTs to the, Jeff? I think. Yes, I think that's, how it works. that's right. So, it's all yeah, SRT so. to Jeff, but it's RTMP right out of Norway. Yeah. And so I, um, I've got a highlight Ron Hoff, uh, Ron Hoff saw here on the panel. Yesterday, he spent a lot of time showing people how to do their encoding. And uh, how did that go? A lot of support there. It what was, was what, were, what were some of the key uh, things running? Well, um, we had to find solutions for those that didn't have uh, experience with streaming SRT. So normally we just uh, started up uh, OBS and uh, made sure that they had the correct settings on the inputs, and um, uh, and made sure that we constructed the URL uh, that is going into the stream uh, settings of the OBS and then hit play and uh, changed IP address and port numbers as we moved along testing all the servers and inputs and uh, good communications both on, on comms and, uh, and using Discord. So it will, went really well. I'm really looking forward to, to looking at those pictures uh, later today. Yeah, and, and more than the experience, it's been it's been such a such a, a fun time. You know, we've been meeting uh, almost weekly for six months, and I think that it's yeah. just been really fun to. It, I, I think what I like about this, about NAB, about many of the other coverages, is beyond the opportunity to do something and stream it. It's just the opportunity to work together. You know, and we're figuring things out and working through it, and you know, kind of nugging through it. It's it's never going to be perfect, but it's it's really been a lot of fun to kind of work through all the process is good. I'm it's very a, impressed with the level of skill advancement yeah. that many of our volunteers have gotten just being even just passive participants have been hearing all about how this works and how it fits together. And that's yeah. a whole new level that they're going to have now. Yeah, yeah, it's really been fun. CJ, it's such a great virtual background. Uh, is that <laughs> I don't, not quite it, not quite um, you're you're in the new you're in a new factory right yes we're in a it's under construction right now so we're going to open here in the fall so right now it's just a great big empty space uh with plenty of southern skyward views so we've got a a little bit of a team coming to ohio today uh josh kaufman brandon goodyear and uh, paul verhagen or verhagen pardon me uh paul and i are here right now uh josh uh and uh josh and brandon are on their way but it's great Here's the shot right now. So, so Paul's tracking the sun for me. Yep. Um, and then I'm here at my desk. So I'm lit by this, you know, I'm looking out at the sky right now. And so far we've been very, very lucky. We were supposed to have cloud cover today and it is blue skies and we are just thrilled. Right. So is, got, is that, a, is that a live photo of the sun right now? That is a live shot of the sun. Paul's helped me keep it in frame. Oh, that's great. And, uh, so we've got a black magic 6k with a 75 to 300 with a magnetic ND. So at, at the moment of totality, you can just, you pop don't have off. to unscrew anything and just pop it off. Um, and then you've got an iPhone is giving you the return of Paul. There's an Insta 360 over on a conduit pole in the corner over there. And then I've got the uh, ZVE 10, uh, for my shot, which, uh, I'm learning Courtney struggles with uh, the sun because it moves and I, my LUT is no good anymore, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, and Brandon's bringing a van. Oh, he's, wow. he's bringing a solar van with a shower and a, and, and a stove and a bathroom. And it's like, he can pull it up and he's like, we don't need power. I, I was like, I've got power. It's like, he's like, no, we don't need power. We can go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So, but it was, <laughs> it was kind of last minute. Uh, we did uh, kudos to Josh for, uh, for, for, to Josh Kaufman for really rallying the troops around the Ohio group here, because he kind of said, well, I've got, a piece and brandon's got a piece and you've got a piece where uh, we managed to procure a starlink to get uh internet out here because we were nervous about the uh we were nervous about cellular congestion out here and uh, so we said well the, this will be less crowded and then uh josh kind of put us all together and said well we can really make something happen out here so we've got you know three atems coming in it's it's we're we're really fortunate but also i i was lucky i just want to say i was lucky enough to see the eclipse in 2017 out in Missouri. And so I've kind of, ever since we've uh, been talking about the eclipse, I've just kind of been thinking to myself, how can I, what can I capture? How can I capture it? How can I take it to the next level? Cause last time I was the guy who just had an iPhone with the little, you know, eclipse glass over the lens. This time I brought the kitchen sink because this is my last opportunity. I will never get an opportunity for the next 
20 years at least to bring this much gear to an eclipse. So we've kind of brought everything we could possibly bring. It's awesome. Bill? So it'll be really exciting. I think I'm so looking forward to today. There's so many people that have partnered up to help us with this. And I've been, you know, it's been every day there's something new in these last minute editions. So for those of you, we have a question coming up here about, uh, what are the timeline and locations of our schedule to appear things? And I will just tell you about the office hours community that is going to be involved in this. First of all, Alex and Matt Wood, who's from Perth Observatory in Western Australia, are going to be, the three of us are going to be kind of guiding you through this. But at 1122, we're expecting to go to Todd Raines in Allen, Texas. Then at 1128, immediately thereafter, Jarrett Keithley will be coming to us from Lake E, Texas. Uh, then 1148, Kyle Hammond from North Little Rock, Arkansas. 1154, we're going to Aaron Cody in Burfordville, Missouri. At 12.12, our team here that was just talking, CJ, Josh, Brandon, and others will be coming to us from Eaton, Ohio. At 12.32, we'll be heading out to Alan Scott in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, as it gets out toward the outer edges of things. And, and my fingers are so crossed for this, at 12.34, we are hoping to have a balloon view. So even if there's clouds or anything, we understand that somebody's got a camera mounted on a balloon for an aerial shot. So we're going to head out. Uh, Alan Scott's going to be coordinating that from New Brunswick as well. So you know, the farther east you go, the less chance of clouds. So as we get into this, we may have some problems with the Texas folks at front because the weather is always problematic. But as we get toward the end of things, and certainly even if we're clouded everywhere else, which fingers crossed doesn't look like we will be, the balloon viewing, we would still get to see a pristine eclipse shot there. So we're really excited for today. Good, Courtney. Now, what if the eclipse is behind the balloon? Uh <laughs> <laughs> that might be a problem. They, you know, you never know which way it's going to drift. Uh, I, thanks. You just answered uh, one of the questions I had, which is the schedule of where's the furthest south we're going to be starting. And, and that Umbra is moving at more than 1,500 miles an hour. So it's a, a pretty quick trip up along across the United States and up into Canada. Uh, what's the best way to watch for those of us here that are normally in the panel to watch? Would it be YouTube or Mukana? Uh, will there be time to ask a question of each of the locales, or is it going to be too fast and furious uh, to ask questions? Uh, no, or? definitely, uh, uh, definitely use Makana. Uh, use use the QR code. So, askofficehours.global is the best way to send questions in. We'll be monitoring those and bringing those in during the show. So, that's the best place to ask ask them is askofficehours.global. Yeah. And so. watching via YouTube channel or uh, you can watch on YouTube channel. Feed. You can watch, you can still watch in Makana and you can still chat. And, and again, you can use both of those to ask questions. It's, it's pretty much like a regular show for us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Bill and I will see him on the back end. Bill's going to be kind of running the show and I'm going to be trying to be useful occasionally. Um, and, but I'll, I'll keep track of all the questions coming in and be able to kind of help support Bill um, in that, in that area. So I'll be pulling questions in and I'll tell Bill when we have questions and he can keep on. And I'll say, you know, hopefully useful things every once in a while. But, but for and the I'm going to rely on Matt a lot. And hopefully we may have a special guest or two. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Yeah. We've got some, some feelers out. And if we yeah. get somebody I'm looking at the name of right now, I'm going to be mm. so stoked. Yeah. So, yeah. So we'll, um, so, uh, but I, I think it'll be, it should be fun. It'll, it'll be an experience. <laughs> we're besides excited the, about it. It's been an incredible amount of work and incredible group of people working on it. So I highly recommend if you've got time, throw it on the background, listen to it, watch it, see what's going on. Um, we're all, we're all going to learn a lot, um, in the, in this area. And I think, uh, it's been, it's, I think it's going to be really, uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Our first question here uh, comes from Douglas Carmichael. How are we project, uh, protecting the actual camera sensors? Great question. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, everybody was uh, given a special filter. These are almost like foil filters that you put on telescopes and lenses. And you can also get a welding glass. Uh, welding glass. Uh, there was a certain model welding glass recommended to us. Uh, by Adrian Watkin in um, Adelaide, Australia. Nope, he's in New Zealand, sorry. It's it. Carl's in Adelaide there. Uh, and yes, if you're going to watch it through just your eyes, you can use a glass for that. But for cameras, yeah, you can have it so that it's mounted in, in front of the lens. And then when we get to totality, you should be able to pop it out, watch the totality for two minutes, and then put it back in for the return of the sun. So yeah, that, that's the method we're using, and everyone has gone to the, the 
the uh, thin film covers because they find it easier to remove them than put them back on. So, that's hey, Dave, can I add to that? I was doing a lot of reading, and as to the welders thing, I realized there are grades to them, and they were very clear about grade 14. Uh, which are the That's serious exactly right. welder glasses for like undersea and things like that, do it. If you just bought a welder's helmet at something like Home Depot and they have them, I guess, those are 12s and, and 13s. So be wary of that. Don't shoot for a long time or look through a long time through those. Uh, go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what questions we are on. Uh, if this is um, uh, for sending feeds into the OH Eclipse. I think we jumped a little bit here. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Is that sorry? I was trying to get something. I was trying to manage something. We there. did. Yeah. I think the covering question was covered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ronnie. Yeah. So um, if you're going to to uh, stream uh, into the production, I think it's a little bit too late. Uh, Dave will probably uh, talk a little yeah, bit more. We don't about have any. We've added all all the inputs we can add. Um, yeah. You know what 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 I will say is that if you. Um, uh, if you see us put out things like, hey, we're looking for people to work on a project, I would highly recommend getting in early. Uh, we do kind of tend to uh, lock down. Um, it used to be something that we'd have people kind of showing up at the very end. Now we tend to close everything off a month in advance. Um, so uh, usually we're kind of like, okay, this is what we have. These are the people that we have here. Um, and that's going to get more intense. So not less intense. Like, uh, so, so that'll be, so I would, I would definitely do that. Yeah, good, Courtney. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested too. I know we have a lot of cameras set up with uh, long lenses to shoot, uh, shoot the sun itself. But another interesting thing to shoot during the totality is the people around you in the surrounding area as it goes dark and the, the effect that it has on the landscape around you. So I'm hoping we get a couple of wide shots other than just the sun. Uh, because the sun kind of looks the same from each of the locations, but each of the locations are going to handle, uh, the totality a little bit differently. So hopefully they'll have some, uh, uh, they'll be able to cut for a few seconds at least to the people around you uh, uh, observing. Yeah, I think we're we'll, have, we'll be... Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dave. Henry is in New York. He's in Plattsburgh, and he's going to have two cameras, so he's going to be able to cut to a wide shot when people are watching it. The hard part is, uh, is, is that we also, seconds. because we're delivering these clip shots to um, third parties, when we're shooting the eclipse, that's what they're expecting to see. And if we cut away, they may be on our, on our shot. So, so the chances of seeing a lot of the surrounding, I think we'll talk about it, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit limited because of the partnerships that we have there. Go ahead, Ronnie. We are hoping some sound will come up just yeah. for our, our benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. But what you can do, you can participate in, uh, in, um, after hours and, uh, just shoot your uh, video there and, and put it into zoom and uh, you will be good. And uh, a lot of people will be enjoying your photo also there. Next question. Next one comes to us from Robert Green in Los Angeles. What's the timeline and locations of the schedule to appear eclipse guests covered a little of that. Go ahead, CJ. CJ, can you hear me? We can't hear you. Sorry. I'm used to a hardware mute and it's really hard to switch. Yeah. It's, um, hard, to, it's hard to go back. <laughs> It's hard to go back. So, um, I was going to just uh, throw in that uh, the, the Ohio folks will uh, will be here. Um, and our totalities, I think, nine after. So I think, Bill, you might have said it was 14. That might have been for Columbus. And then we shifted a little bit uh, ah. west. But we can we can make sure that we have that tweak. But, yes, we're, uh, we're looking for one. Uh, um, I'm sorry, 309. So that would be 1209 uh, Pacific time for when we're going to get that beautiful totality. I go, Bill. Uh, I was just going to go down that list, and we hit it earlier. So, yeah, let's go ahead and remind the folks so that maybe make sure we, we go ahead and answer it. Like, what? Where are we going? When? Well, according to the run of show that I have, the first hit is going to be at twelve eleven twenty two from Allen, Texas. Then right after that, eleven twenty six with Leaky, Texas. Leaky, excuse me. I understand that I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, then we go down to Aaron Cote at Bufordsville, Missouri, and that'll take place at eleven fifty four according to the original timetable. Um, the next one after that is Eaton, Ohio. That's CJ with Josh K and Brandon. Uh, and then uh, Fredericton is our last stop with Alan Scott and the hopeful balloon view. And that takes place at 1232 p.m. And these right. are so, all Pacific times. So, so basically about an hour of, of a little bit more than an hour of, of coverage of, of actually and a lot of stuff. To, and remember, that's our feeds. 
those are there's plenty of feeds that are right. happening all in between we may be just jumping from one to the next and we'll see some of them with cloud cover some of them with like hey look at the clouds <laughs> we'll just, let's talk over that um but 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 some of them will definitely i think we'll see the eclipse in a couple of places yeah go ahead courtney yeah that's what i was going to suggest those that are in uh, covered by clouds and a lot of texas is covered by clouds this morning they can show the surrounding the effect on the environment which is probably much more interesting if you can't see the sun at all yeah, that can definitely work. Um, next question. Next question comes to us from Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromso, Norway. Where can we watch the program and will there be anything organized in after hours? I don't think we've managed anything in, in after hours. I think the after hours may self-organize around watching it and talking about it. Um, but we've been so focused on the show show. Um, we, I think we didn't, didn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what we would do outside of that. So, but I think, I think that you'll, I would be surprised if we don't see a couple feeds that are sent into after hours that aren't part of our feed. So I would jump in and take a look. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, how are we protecting the actual camera sensors? We chatted about this. Go ahead, CJ. Uh, I think it's like ND 10,000 or ND 100. <laughs> 16 and a half stops of ND is, uh, is we need to have at least 16 stops to properly shoot the sun. So it is, uh, it is dark. It was expensive. Good, Carl. Yeah, that's right. So 16.6. So 16 and two thirds. Um, so this is a thousand, it's called a thousand times. It depends on what manufacturer you get. Um, you can have a solar telescope as well. So there are some solar telescopes that have these built in. Um, you want to be careful of drop-in filters. So if you have a, a super telephoto and it has drop-in filters, you don't want to use that. So you don't want the sun ever going directly into any optical elements. So it has to be at the front of the lens and not a drop-in filter later on. So people who are using um, RF cameras and they have... Um, EF lenses on there, you can put a drop-in filter behind the EF lens. You don't want to do that today. So if you are planning on doing that, um, I'll wire against you don't want the sun coming into your lens barrel ever um, and without those filters in there. Even if you've got one before the sensor, yeah, you protect your sensor, but you're going to destroy your autofocus, your image stabilization, and you're going to destroy your, your all the motor. So everything in there will just get destroyed. So if you've got an expensive lens or you rent an expensive lens, make sure the filter's on the, the first thing the first thing before any light enters the lens. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I was lucky enough to do this with NASA space flight for the annual eclipse in October. And um, this was the picture where we were tracking with a telescope and, and I actually had two of these solar filters and it is so opaque that it looks like a mirror. Like that's not an optical illusion. If you look at that black magic camera, let me see if I've got a better close up there. It looks like it looks like a mirror and that's because it is so dense that shooting directly into a, the sun uh, wasn't you know wasn't possible i didn't have one of the smaller ones so i just i got two of the telescope ones and put one in front of the camera and that was that good bill and i just want to i'm compelled here because we're talking about it in a general form to talk about the safety issues of this please 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 if you're not in the path of absolute totality do not look at the sun even if it's just a sliver with the naked eye this can seriously cause damage to you uh if you're in the path of complete totality and you're coming out don't get lost on your time so that you actually see it particularly if you're watching it through binoculars or something like that this can be incredibly damaging permanently to your eyesight do it correctly and we'll be talking about that during the show but it's important you're right you know this is going to be a yeah. brilliant thing it's going to last for four and four and a half minutes if you're lucky but your eyesight lasts the rest of your life take care and the difference between 99 percent and and 100 percent totality is literally night and day <laughs> so so uh so you do, you definitely want to note that that it is uh you you it doesn't matter if you're not in totality you know then you should you should make sure that you have coverage uh next question Eduardo Augustine in Panama. CJ, how are you getting the iPhone return from Paul's shot into the sun, into your setup? Go ahead, CJ. Okay, so that is uh, pretty straightforward. So that is camera three. Sorry, I don't have a preview monitor here. Oops, no, camera four. Five. <laughs> One of these. So all this is is an Apple TV uh, hooking up to the iPhone mirroring Blackmagic camera app. And uh, one of my favorite parts about this is that I do not have Wi-Fi where I am. The uh, their devices are just talking point to point. They see each other. It's super easy uh, for an ad hoc wireless camera. That's great. Uh, next question. Paul Buchan in Columbus, Ohio. What about audio? Does nature typically get quiet during totality or do humans cheering ruin that? Good, Dave. 
Yeah, it's going to be, we're going to try this. We're going to try for those who can put a mic out, uh, see if we can hear the change. Uh, sometimes things go quiet. Sometimes you're away from everything, but which CJ seems to be. So there won't be anything to go quieter except maybe crickets. Uh, but some people say they see the birds come down, that sort of thing. The other thing we're hoping to hear is the reaction of the crowd. That is definitely something we want. So for the pro uh, program, we're going to have quiet spots where we be quiet and like golf, and we let the, the crowd show us what's going on. And for us to just enjoy these beautiful shots that are going to come in uh, as they come through. I also wanted to mention that we're going to show probably more than one feed at a time. Uh, the overlap in time is going to be pretty obvious as they approach and disappear. And so we're going to try to have three sources going at a time and show you the process and then go full screen to anyone that's going into totality. So that's, you know, if you're worried about missing any of our locations, we're going to try and show what's going on, even if, as Alex says, even if they're just sitting there looking at your cloud. Good, Carl. So rather than being quiet, it's actually quite the opposite. If you've ever experienced a total eclipse and you're actually just near any kind of wooded area, so any area that may have birds and wildlife, it is actually the noisiest thing you'll ever hear. Because birds will communicate at different parts of sunset. So when the sun is slightly getting set, and when, you know, later on, other birds will chirp in and when it's like completely dark, other day, and what they're doing is they're saying, where's the food? Where are we nesting? That's what they're saying to each other. When you have totalitarian, you know, when you have that kind of happen instantly, all the birds go off all at once and they go bonkers because they don't know what's going on. And they're sending out alarm calls to each other. So this is, there's a lot of studies that have been done into this. They're sending out alarm calls, they're sending out food calls, they're sending out safety calls to each other. And then two minutes later, they're calling out sunset calls. I'm um, sorry, sunrise calls because the sun's coming back. They don't understand there's a total eclipse. They just think this is the shortest nighttime they've ever had. And they're going crazy about feeding and nesting and finding their friends. So it's actually, if you're in a wooded area and, you, and you're lucky enough to be, it is a, one of the loudest things you'll ever hear from, especially from birds. They just go nuts. And I know that in India, all the monkeys went absolutely berserk for two minutes because they just didn't know what was going on. It was, yeah, they, they, no, no, they had no, no process for it. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that was actually an interesting thing. As I was looking at the path, particularly up in Maine, I was going, well, there's not a lot of cities up there. That's the middle of the forest up in the northeast corner of the country. And I was wondering, so thank you for that, Carl. I always thought it'd be a great time to be camping just by yourself or maybe on a boat on a lake out with clear skies. And I wonder what it would sound like. So you give me a hint on that. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and if you're if you're not in the area of totality, or if you're in an area of totality and the time leading up to, if you're in in an area that has vegetation, uh, a real interesting uh, effect happens. Uh, look at the shadows cast by the trees because they form little crescents, and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. The the mottled light coming from the sunlight coming through trees is uh, it's a very bizarre experience. You see these little curved crescents everywhere of the sun. Next question. Roz Humphreys in Comax, British Columbia. Any thoughts on Iceland in 2026? Has anybody looked at the logistics yet? We're planning to attend that one. Go ahead, Dave. You have to book your hotel today because there's not too many. Uh, the I Iceland was, has a population of a half a million people. I thought it was Greenland, the, 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 the main, I thought it was, but yeah, I'm, Iceland I'm already. Is not far. Yeah. Yeah. I, but, uh, I, I am already researching the hotels. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm looking at making it a, a family outing, uh, and knowing, I think I'm going into that one knowing that it might be cloudy and then we're just going to see green, you know, or, or Iceland, which, whichever one we're going to go to. Um, it's going to be, you know, the idea is the eclipse will be part of a one week vacation. So I'm starting, that's one of the few vacations I'm planning. Uh, kind of a vacation. My wife doesn't let me define them as vacations if I bring cameras. So, um, cause she knows that I'll just work the whole time. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but the, um, uh, but I'm gonna, uh, I think we're gonna, we're definitely going to see that one in 2026 and we're going to get, again, I, I do agree with Dave, probably don't need to buy it yet. In fact, a lot of places won't let you book out more than a year, but, um, but we are definitely going to be, I'm definitely researching it right now. I'm actually planning a recon trip. So I'll let people know when that happens. Uh, just to just take a look at, at stuff. It's a good excuse to go get on a plane and go somewhere where there's not a lot of people, which is usually my favorite. Uh, go ahead, Carl. So the part of Greenland that it's going over is the uninhabited part. So it's the Amazing. western side of Greenland is actually the inhabited better. part. Well, you, good luck getting out there. I think like even the, lo the locals don't even live on that side. Now it is a very, very tippy tip, southern tip of 
um, Iceland that's going to be covered. So where the volcano is currently going on. So right down there where the blue lake. <laughs> I'd is. rather go to snow than volcanoes. That's all I'm saying. So, is snow uh, versus volcanoes. It, it would be an adventure of a lifetime because you're going to like the area of of Greenland that is like completely like out of bounds for nearly all humans because there's no infrastructure on that side of the love that. of the, that's... Of the, of the country right. um the australian one's kind of interesting so if you want a cloud free one that's actually going to be like almost 100 percent cloud free for a big part of it because it's going through the northern territory it's going through what's called the simpson desert which is like crazy simpson desert that's actually you don't want to be caught out even an australian doesn't go out there because it's that's dangerous um but the thing is it's going to pass over sydney it's going to pass over a, a city with 5 million people. So that's going to be a really interesting one that's going to happen in uh, 2028. But the, it's going to happen during the dry season too, right in the middle of the dry season. So the Northern Territory, it's the Northern half of Australia um, and the center of Australia is absolutely cloudless for like four months. It's like complete drought. Um, and so that's going to be one that's going to be really interesting if you want to photograph it and you kind of guarantee no matter where you go. The only thing out there is there's no infrastructure. Unless you go to Sydney, Sydney may have a higher chance because it's winter. You keep on saying year. there's going to be there's going to be no infrastructure. Like that's a bad thing. Like, it's it, be well, in the in the Simpson Desert, like that is dangerous. Like there are signs out there. Once you go off, like the you know the ribbon of tarmac that goes from the top of the street to the bottom, there's only like two of them. Like, so it looks like in. so there is one on, in 2027, right? That goes kind yeah. Of there's quickly. one in North Africa, Egypt. So right. Egypt's going to be crazy. That's going to be an amazing one to see because you can actually go to yeah. a temple and see an eclipse at a temple. Yeah. So it's going right through the middle of Egypt, yeah. right, right across the Nile. So that one's pretty cool. Yeah. So the, there's a good opportunity to, uh, to do some traveling. Um, next question. Rian Smith in Trinidad, West Indies is up next. And Rian says, can I get a link and start time to begin sharing it for friends? Uh, it is, uh, you just go to officehours.global. Uh, You'll see a link to it. That's the easy. Or you just go to our YouTube page. So if you want to go, but but you can go officehours.global or go to the Office Hours Global YouTube page and you'll see it there. So just our search, it's just, you. I think it's just youtube.com slash officehoursglobal. And you should be able to get to our to our YouTube page. That's going to be the easiest way to see it. Uh, if you want to interact with it. 11 a.m. Pacific. 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, next question. Uh, Daniel Lund in Proctor, New Mexico. From the time the eclipse starts in the USA to the time it leaves is how many hours and minutes? All right, go ahead, Dave. 64 minutes. There you go. It's traveling at about 1,900 miles an hour, and it just transits really fast. But it is almost the entire length, or rather width, of North America. It's really amazing. And when we start at 11, that's about 20 minutes before the first coverage we'll have of that's the right actual yeah. Clip. yeah next question so we'll be talking about it beforehand the next question comes from matt cool in uh montreal quebec canada oh no wait a second i'm wrong yep. is Rian again. That, rion's back mm -hmm. with another one from trinidad that's what it is you said the third camera is an insta 360 which cam is it and how are you getting the feed good cj uh, this is the Insta360 feed. It is going into an OBSBOT UVC to HDMI. There is an Anchor 737 battery powering the OBSBOT. Uh, and there is a, the six-foot Thunderbolt cable that came with my MacBook charger back in the day is uh, running it up the wall, and it's Velcroed to the side of a piece of electrical conduit. So <laughs> getting creative. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes from uh, Matt Cool, Montreal, Quebec. Thanks for the advice to not shoot the eclipse today. I'm driving to uh, be directly on the line of totality south of Montreal, but we'll just be watching it with my family. Enjoy your day. Yes, just just enjoy it. Like it's just a, it's a moment. And if you haven't spent a lot of time talking, we spent our teams have spent six months talking about it, and we've been trading notes and we've been doing all those things. If you're just if you thought today you're going to get up and and shoot it, don't don't even take up your phone. Like take pictures of your family, you're there and everything else. And maybe some of the environment, take a couple of photos. But in general, it is, you know, they, they said, I guess in a study, they said that half, half of the population will cry when they see it. Like, like, like literally that's the statistic. And we had, we had, uh, we had someone who had seen it first time in our, in our, uh, uh, a couple of people in our team got emotional when they were, uh, when they saw the eclipse, um, on the first time it's, it, it it's hard to describe the impact of it. It's really, really interesting. So, so just, just go and be there and enjoy it. Um, next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in San Jose, California today. How did the plans evolve over the last six months until today? You know, I think that it, you know, some of the things expanded. So how we're interacting with time and date, how we're interacting with, uh, you know, uh, NASA space flight that expanded. 
uh, it turned out that I couldn't manage both the Eclipse and NAB at the same time. And so, uh, really what turned the corner there is NAB got, <laughs> once we had sponsors and a free booth, uh, the, the level that I had to do at NAB became much less casual. Um, and so everything kind of shifted there and I, and I tried to manage it for a little while and wasn't able to do that. Um, and we thought that we would have a space that we could set up. We, we expected to have, we thought there might be a chance to have an astronomer with some stuff there and that didn't, you know, they had some own, sh their own ships that happened there. So there's been a bunch of ups and downs of, of, of the of location stuff. Um, but the partnerships and the other locate, you know, the expanded locations have all gotten better and expanded. So there's this, you know, from where we started, you start off with this idea and as it's come down, some of it's gotten a little bit smaller than we expected. And some of it's gotten a lot bigger than we expected. And, and again, the thing that kind of popped this thing open was VBCR. You know, when we said, Hey, we've got this way to just get all these feeds back and forth. I think that's going to be transformational. And I think that's going to impact eclipses in the future is the idea that we can have a one holding place where all these feeds go in and out. Uh, it just really was transformational. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Ju uh, just to add a little bit more to that, we had initial meetings just to see where the interest was and see who might want to be a field person or work with us in the back end. And we've, we've focused on field team for probably two whole months, getting it all worked out as to how their feeds are going to come in, whether they're going to have intermittent or even this live view stuff and all that. And then we worked with back end crew and got that coordinated for this cross connect thing that we're doing. And it was really interesting how everything just kind of naturally evolved through that process. And uh, we had meetings every week uh, on this subject and it was uh, incredible, just incredible. Yeah. And I also want to thank Jim. Uh, Jeff Keithley, um, because he's, you know, he's been made his rig and his understanding of how a lot of these feeds go in and out in the cloud, working with VVCR, um, you know, so Jeff, one F Jeff, um, pizzazz, uh, has been really, uh, really been great. So that's been another big, big thing that's helped. And then just an incredible, all the back end team, you know, the, you know, JJ and Mickey and, and many of the other back end team have, have all, you know, brought this up as well. So they've, they've all, you know, there's a whole not just the folks that are on the ground, but you'll see in the credits, all these other folks that have to, that are required to make this all work. <laughs> you know, so then like, and so it's, it's a, it's a big lift. Um, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto for any of the eclipses that only pass over the ocean. Are there any special cruises for eclipse viewing? Go ahead, Dave. Well, as uh, Alex was describing earlier, this is a short moment. And if you're in a cruise ship and you got to be at the right place at exactly the right time for when that thing shadow goes over you. And the ship is not very big, so you're not going to see it approach very well, and, and you might miss it entirely. So the land is really where a lot of this can be seen. It does go over the ocean a lot, and some of the small islands in the South Pacific uh, enjoy them, and some cruises take you to some of these places. But on the ocean itself, very difficult to find it. Good, Carl. So this was um, still very popular now. I think the one that's happening over Greenland is going to have a lot of ships in there because the end of the eclipse is happening off the coast of um, Ireland, off the coast of Portugal, off the coast of Spain and France. So you'll have a lot of, a lot of European cruise ships. It happens a lot in the Pacific here in Australia. So there's a lot of ships that leave from the eastern seaboard of Australia and go out to the Pacific to do these. These were very popular before COVID. They're a little bit less, well, it's just not less popular since COVID. It's just, you know, COVID hit the cruise industry quite hard. So they have to make money other ways generally. So these kind of um, jaunts that go out and come back, they're only going out really for eclipse chases. So I don't know if the market's big enough, but the one that's happening over Greenland, that's going to be a very big one for the European local cruisers. Because they can just pop out of the Mediterranean and go off the coast of Portugal. And there's like a long stretch of, of um, penumbra will go from Ireland down to Portugal. So I think that will be a big one we'll see two years from now. It was, I, I think in the last one, the, 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 the coolest thing I, I saw someone do is they, I guess went over to South Carolina and they had a bunch of boats out in the Harbor and they actually had, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the woman who sings, I can't, I was just dropped uh, Bonnie Tyler uh, singing total eclipse of the heart. They did a concert with her singing it right before the thing. It was, I thought it was funny. Uh, anyway, uh, next, next question. Uh, Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in San Jose. Historically, which civilization was first able to predict eclipses? Go ahead, CJ. There was a great article in New York Times yesterday about this uh, that said that there was a Greek philosopher, Thales, uh, who tried to get this 2,600 years ago, and he was the most accurate then. But then accuracy meant a year. He was within a year of predicting the eclipse. Really, it wasn't until the, the 1500s when Copernicus proposed that the sun was the center of the solar system, not the Earth that they were able to get it 
uh, really nailed down. The big breakthrough was actually uh, late 1600s. Isaac Newton and the laws of gravitational attraction that let him nail it right down. So Isaac Newton. You go to Carl. Yeah, that's right. So it's right up until essentially what we, we call like the Renaissance and the um, age of enlightenment is when we had precise, like we knew kind of which day, but um, we kind of knew they knew cycles of years when they would happen. Um, so there is this kind of calculation. And so uh, Mesopotamia, so this is kind of not really Sumerians, but probably be the uh, Babylonians and the, and the Hittites, all those people through Mesopotamia um, around 2000 BC. Um, the Chinese started to actually keep, so the, the trick to do this back then wasn't to predict it, was to look at all the ones that happened in the past and keep records. So you can actually see the patterns arrive. So there are patterns, of course, um, for your given area. And so the Chinese were very good at this. So the Chinese had the most detailed patterns because they had a large catchment area. Mesopotamia was much smaller to catchment area. So the Chinese had the best records and they could figure it out. And then you're right, right up until we can actually figure it out mathematically, which was really Newton. And that's why Newton is Newton. You go ahead, um, Bill. Well, I just, if you want some fun afterwards, because we're too close to it now, probably, I was looking at ancient myths about eclipses, and it is so much fun. In Vietnam, they were talking about a giant frog devouring the sun in ancient China. Celestial dragon was thought to lunch on the sun. There were just so many people for so much of human history have been seeing this phenomenon and going, what is going on? You know, Norse culture, they had blamed wolves for eating the sun. This has been literally part of the human adventure since there were humans on the planet. And so I think it's just extraordinary that we're going to be able to use all the technology and all the science and all the true understanding of celestial mechanics and the rest of that to put it into a modern context because people have been trying to, to understand this phenomenon literally since the early days of humans. Go ahead, CJ. The, the, uh, the article was one of the points that it made was that the eclipse came out and there was a brutal year long, years long war that was taking place. The eclipse came and they saw it as an omen and they stopped the war. Like this is, this is a, uh, we think it's cool now, but when we didn't understand it the way that we do today, it really had such an amazing impact. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. Like a lot of the things that you see out there, you know, everything from Stonehenge to many other cultures, you know, tracking celestial, uh, you know, uh, occurrences was a pretty big accept, um, obsession for everybody because it especially if you could predict that you had some power like it's going to there the, the the moon is going to cover the sun tomorrow i predict it and then when you say that they were like oh okay that's what he's talking about you know and so then after that you can say anything uh go ahead courtney yeah if you've ever uh, seen the movie or read the story from uh, mark twain a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court there's a major plot line in that story that has to do with uh the main character knowing the date of the eclipse and using it to get out of a difficult situation uh because he uh goes back in king arthur's court where they don't know anything about uh the eclipse so he becomes a magician next question Comes from Ronnie Hosfsoy in Tromsø. Uh, will the International Space Station be able to observe the shadow hitting the globe, or will it miss it? Good, Carl. Yeah, so they will be able to see it um, just before it leaves the United States, so getting up towards Maine. So that's when their that's when their view from the International Space Station and the penumbra kind of match up where they can actually see it. Um, they'll be able to look uh, like in the zenith, which is looking you know out towards space. Um, they'll be able to see partial clips. And they'll be, they'll be taking photos, you know, because uh, the Russians have a, a port that looks out that way. Um, but they'll be actually able to see the shadow on the Earth uh, towards the end of the U.S. portion of it. Next question. Lou Perez in Santan Valley, Arizona. Delta Airlines has a flight that plans to follow the eclipse. Anyone else wishing they were on this flight? And he's got a link to the news of it. Good, Carl. As Alex mentioned before, unless Delta actually have a Concorde that they're going to pull out of mothballs. Yeah. So they can change it, it a little bit. So it'll, you know, they'll, they'll it'll, extend it probably from mm -hmm. four minutes to maybe 10 minutes. I reckon you could probably get yeah. that, you know, cause you go from one end of the penumbra to the other edge of the penumbra. Yeah. Um, I've had it myself. So I've, I've actually flown from Sydney to Adelaide and had a per, um, perpetual sunrise. So that's pretty cool when you can actually do that. So the sun is constantly rising the whole time I was flying from Sydney to Adelaide. So that's kind of a similar thing, but it's, um, you, as Alex said, you actually do need to be going uh, faster than the speed of sound. Uh, pretty much no matter where you are on the earth to, to chase an eclipse. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can you can stretch it out a little bit. And the other thing is, is that um, one thing that we we kind of got into what you're looking for there is not really you're not going to be looking up, you're going to be looking down the shadow. So, uh, and then the, the problem there is only half the, the the plane will be able to see the shadow. <laughs> so, so there's you know like because they're going to have to they're going to have to turn the plane a little bit to most likely so that you can look down at it. And so it's not going to be visible from both sides. It's going to be crowded over one side. I don't think I'd be that excited about being. Um, I don't think I'd be that excited about being on that plane. I think it's going to be relatively contained. I think that if you're over the, again, if you're over the wing, you're there's so many places you're not going to be able to see something um, that I'm not sure if I'd want to be in the plane for for that experience. But but the um, uh, we did a bunch of tests. We were looking at potentially shooting the shadow uh, for 2017, um, and we did a bunch of we were fortunate enough to do a bunch of tests in a g4 <laughs> so, 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 so to look at whether we were whether that was going to be viable or not and we did we chose to that it wasn't viable but like I, I got a lot of little triangular sandwiches now go ahead uh courtney yeah i saw an interview with the pilot of that plane uh, this morning and they said they are going to uh bank the plane so the people on one side can uh observe the eclipse and the other side's observing the ground and then they bank it the other way so they can all switch vice versa but and they added an additional flight i think because of course there was a lot of popularity in that flight and the planes aren't that <laughs> and big i imagine it cost a lot of money for a seat on that plane yeah exactly it was a really cute thing to do yeah uh next next question uh just watching guy bank his shot yeah. that was interesting uh, james wilson in palo alto california is vvcr similar to nimble streamer I think VVCR is using nimble streamer, <laughs> so I think it's not only similar; it's just a very, very powerful version of it. So it's there. There, I think that that's what the I, I believe that that's the back end for VVCR. It's just that they put so much great interface on the front, you know. So it, that's what took all the work is to um, have something that it, it's just drop downs to connect people all, the, you know, to give you connections and then to redistribute those connections. It's uh, it's very, very straightforward. So yeah, it, it is similar to that, very similar to that. But it's uh, but it it's the it's all the interface that that LiveX has put on top of it that's made it worth using. So it's been been great. All right, well we are ramping up. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna close this show up. Uh, we're gonna let the team to get get to get ready to go. Um, everyone's gonna be doing their final setups and checking in and everything else. Um, and we'll start streaming. You'll see. Uh, we'll we'll start streaming at 11 a.m. Just go to the just go to our YouTube channel or go to officehours.global for a link. Um, but at 11 a.m., uh, we will start the stream. Uh, Bill will be hosting the stream. I will be every once in a while putting in some hopefully useful comments. More than um, that, I hope, Alex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so two hours. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but we'll but we'll Matt, be Matt we'll be chit chatting. We'll be hoping hoping to answer as many of your questions as you have uh, as, as we can. Um, and we'll be showing you some of the behind the scenes as we get ready. We'll be cutting back and forth to different people with their feeds and. You'll be able to see what's going on. So there'll be lots to see. Um, and again, that is at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time today. And it'll go from 11 to about 1 o'clock. We'll, we'll close it up as it, as it makes sense once we get to the last one, um, if there's anything else to say. So, um, so it's exciting times. And I just want to thank everybody that's done all the work on this, uh, you know, on the back end, all the planning, all the locations. There's been a lot of work um, to get ready for this. And so we just want to thank everybody for that. We also want to thank, of course, everybody here. You know, thank the panel. It's been really great to have everybody here. Um, and uh, we, we can't do it without you. And it's these. this is like the perfect size panel. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's good. So thank you so much for everyone for jumping on and being part of this conversation today. Um, and I want to thank, of course, the incredible dev team on the back end that makes this happen every single day. There's been a big lift and we're still lifting, um, getting from one place to the other. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the dev team and Jeff uh, Keithley, who's really also made it possible for us to keep this moving forward. Um, and uh, but the, the there's been a lot of you know we haven't missed a day since since March 25th, 2020, and a lot of it has to do with the kind of lifts we've been doing over the weekend, where we're moving. Um, you know, we, we had to move an entire entire location, so uh, so it's it's been it's been really good. Um, so thank you all for the work, hard work that's being done there, and of course thank you to the producers watching the show, asking the questions and uh, keeping this go going forward. Um, today, if we had had to walk and ask these questions person by person, we would have traveled 91,000 miles on the Tlaloc Traversal. It's 146,000 uh, kilometers, and that is 718 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. This During is banana eclipse eclipsing the, uh, mug. We think, we right think it might be about, a, that might have been like over a billion plantains. This is what the uh, shadow looks like and during the eclipse. I found a picture from last year.
They look like little bananas. Oh, wow. mine from October. Should it be mug news. eclipsing banana? Just wondering. Oh, no, you're right, Bill. You're right. Mug eclipsing banana. There it is. There's yeah. Kale. Got those little crescents. Look like bananas. That's Having my Doc Brown moment here with these glasses. Great yeah. sky. <laughs> All right, well, let's go to it. We're gonna All right, we'll see you in a little bit. Out. Thanks, everybody. I'll be watching. Excellent.